Hello, everyone. My name is Oksana. It's Road to Edwards, weekly Edwards Insider, the third. We deliver the news about the creation of our project, Edwards. So, please, first, may I ask Tokugawa san to speak? Okay, thank you, Oksana. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Hiro Tokugawa speaking. Uh, and, uh, well, this is, well, we're talking about. Uh, well, I am talking about uh, the Edo civilization, which is known like one of the longest periods of peace in a time of war. Uh, this is horrible. And what we hear and see every day on the news is really heartbreaking. And, uh, and also this has, th this experience will probably help us understand what Tokugawa Ieyasu was thinking as he created the new city of Edo and also the uh, Tokugawa re regime. Uh, because uh, you see, well, last week, I think I talked about uh, how the old order collapsed in Japan with the rise of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. So that is one legacy. Before Hideyoshi, all the samurai, the uh, big samurai, uh, their bloodlines could be uh, led, traced all the way back to the imperial family. Uh, but all those old, really uh, noble samurai families had perished or had lost power completely in the long civil war period. And at the very end, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, without any family background, uh, had come to the top, uh, imperial regent and former imperial, imperial regent. Uh, and that alone uh, changed Japan profoundly. Anyone could be a part of the political or, or a game, the power game. And, and then there is another uh, scary legacy of the Toyotomi, and that was his invasion of Korea starting in 1592. Uh, the Korean uh, kingdom was a suzerainty of uh, China. So they didn't have their own military. Their population, I don't know, would be uh, like three, four million back then. And Hideyoshi invaded with an army of 150,000. You see, and that already. So the Russians had amassed an army of 200,000 on the Ukrainian border. So, and it's pretty close to that. And what's even more amazing is that Japan's population at the time is estimated to be uh, somewhere between 13 and 15 million. 1% of the population was mobilized and they crossed the Atsushima Straits, uh, much, much wider than the Dover Strait, and invaded Korea, which didn't have its own army. So it must have been really terrifying for the Koreans. And this uh, invasive war continued for six years. And the Japanese fought uh, quite ferociously. Uh, these were not conscripts. Uh, these were, well, uh, mostly commoners. Uh, many of them were commoners who thought that if they hey, cut off a Korean or Chinese head or two, then they could become samurai and then go up the ranks as they kept fighting. So they were highly motivated. And uh, the, the Chinese soldiers, or the uh, mobilized Chinese army, the Ming army, uh, were exhausted from their fighting with the Mongols and the Manchus. Uh, so it was like one Japanese soldier would be equal to 10 Chinese soldiers in terms of military strength. I mean, I think you're witnessing something similar. Uh, the Ukrainians today are highly motivated, whereas the Russians are mostly conscripts who don't even know where they are right now. Uh, so you will see big difference in morale. So, uh, but here, uh, interesting, it was the invading side that was highly motivated. So, but this naturally, six years, uh, but in the end, no victory. Uh, the Koreans, uh, the Korean guerrillas fought and uh, the Chinese had numerical strength and they were more experienced in, uh, well, then they were very well experienced, exhausted, but the general's new strategy. Whereas on the Japanese side, uh, the daimyo, generals uh, could not really control their forces. Their forces want to keep, wanted to keep fighting, but the daimyos could not keep funding this expeditionary force forever. So uh, in 1598, uh, six years after Hideyoshi, Toyotomi Hideyoshi started this war, uh, Hideyoshi died and Tokugawa Ieyasu assumed power and then he withdrew the expeditionary force immediately. So, uh, and the ensuing friction inside Japan is the, was the cause of the Battle of Sekigahara, and which eventually led to the uh, creation of the Tokugawa Shogunate. But what's important, and this is something that no historian in Japan uh, has ever thought of, they never discussed this, it's maybe consciously, is that uh, for a great many Japanese, the war in Korea 
uh, was ours to lose. I mean, uh, the Japanese were fighting, a Japanese samurai uh, runs into the Koreans or the Chinese and they flee. The Japanese were so ferocious, fearless, uh, and also they were quite stupid, not well educated. So uh, if, if you keep chasing that, eventually you exhaust yourself. And then the defensive side would do their counterattack. But they couldn't think so strategically. See, so as Ieyasu withdrew the troops, uh, many of them were, in my imagination, I'm probably right, were very much frustrated. They're thinking, the uh, soldiers on the ground, the grunts thinking was that if they kept fighting, then they would have won eventually. And we had to terminate an otherwise successful operation. So this was the majority, this must have been the majority feelings amongst the low ranking samurai, which are half commoners. Uh, and this would form the bulk of the samurai class during the Tokugawa period all over Japan. Uh, the, uh, those who have been, who have been fighting with the Ieyasu for six decades, uh, they were different. Uh, they never went to Korea. Uh, so this was more, more on the Western half of Japan uh, and especially in particular Kyushu. So uh, the Tokugawa regime had to neutralize this, uh, how should I say, uh, well, desire for another war. So it's, it's not that Japan had suddenly become inward looking or that it shut itself to the outside world. Uh, Japan remained a major trading country, a major trading nation throughout the Tokugawa era. But uh, it's just that it moved towards self-sufficiency so that uh, the country as a whole could limit con exchange with the outside world as much as possible uh, so that no one would think about the outside world, which would automatically, which would have automatically led to a popular demand for another war. You see, that is the nature of the Tokugawa piece. You see, the, the, uh, the pacifism of the Tokugawa shogun and all the daimyo was actually a minority opinion. A lot of people wanted war. And to make matters worse, uh, in the uh, Kojiki, the record of ancient facts, uh, it is written very clearly that uh, South Korea, Southern Korea, uh, belongs to Japan. Seriously, so uh, a mythical empress, Jingu, uh, went to conquer Korea, and, sh and, and then uh, there was a tsunami that, and, and Korea was at the time devastated by tsunami, so they were all struck and they decided to uh, become a part of Japan, but, and then uh, things went murky after that, or something, some such. So during, uh, even from the early Tokugawa period, uh, some thinkers and some, you know, well, his name is Yamaga, uh, he was a, how should I say, a very early uh, nativist thinker, but he wrote very clearly that uh, Korea is originally Japan since the times of the Kojiki, and Hideyoshi simply went to reclaim what is rightfully ours. See? And having written this, uh, this guy ended up in prison. He died in prison, actually. Yamaga Soko died in prison, and probably for writing this, but there, there are many pieces of evidence showing that. So uh, the long piece of Tokugawa is, it is described as like Japan uh, having slept for so long, but it was quite on the contrary. Uh, the samurai elite were always watchful of the people demanding war or some kind of uh, foreign adventure. And, and what was lucky for Japan was that uh, the northeast of Japan, uh, Tohoku Chiho, was back then quite sparsely populated. Even the, uh, this vast Kanto plains uh, were barely inhabited, you know, and this is why Tokugawa Ieyasu uh, decided to make a major development of the area surrounding Edo. You see, this was the open space, so uh, the excess population of Western Japan who had no choice but to uh, go, uh, to bet on an invasive uh, war of aggression. Okay, to move to Eastern Japan and start a new, more peaceful and productive life. That was the uh, guiding philosophy of Tokugawa Japan. And this also explains why, so after the warring, uh, after the warring states, uh, Sengoku, uh, civil war period, there's a long piece of the Tokugawa, but once the Tokugawa lost power, we lost power, uh, that Japan is constantly making war again. See, there's strong societal demand for war, a popular demographic pressure. And then the uh, Tokugawa samurai regime put a lid on that. But, and then it was blown apart by the internal pressure. 
So that's a long history of uh, that. That is a long story of Japanese history. I've never put him that way, but uh, I call, so that's why I call, I call uh, Meiji Restoration a, actually a Toyotomi revival. Uh, the emperor was always uh, the head of state, even during Tokugawa times. Uh, when uh, the shogun sent a mission to the United States uh, in about 1860, uh, it said very, it stated very clearly, it is the empire of Japan. And Tokugawa, or Minamoto uh, Iesada, the shogun, uh, is like the third ranking uh, officer of the imperial government. So there was never a need for restoration. What was restored was the spirit of Toyotomi Japan. Uh, which could be summarized as war and social mo mobility. The more you fight, uh, the more social mobility there is. And people kept fighting uh, for bettering his position. And it was always his, his position in society. And this Japan came to an end with the end of World War II, after most of Japan got incinerated by American bombing. And we live in the aftermaths. So in a sense, uh, we're reliving uh, Tokugawa Japan in that uh, there's a major war in the Asian, led by the Japanese, well, major war fought by the Japanese in the Asian mainland, which ended in a disaster. And we're trying to rebuild a peaceful Japan again. So uh, it's officially, no one wants to admit this. Uh, official Japan doesn't want to admit this, but post-war Japan is Tokugawa Japan all over again. It was built on the aftermaths of a devastating war. And although it is of our own making, we also suffered enormously. And then how to overcome as war creates war, war begets war. Aggression changes people, violence changes people. So throughout uh, the post-war period, after 1945, and also after 1598 or 1600, after the Battle of Sekigahara, Japan, spent like 60 years overcoming the PTSD of those major wars. So you see, this is deep history and it's also very, very actual. And I hope this could be of self, some help for the eventual and, and hopefully soon happening reconstruction of the Ukraines. Thank yeah. you. Oksana. Thank you, Tokugawa-san, for speaking about this. I'm also, I, I tried to look back at uh, the history of Japan or other countries to understand that uh, you know big changes come from uh, like big disaster like war and uh, i feel that if this events will make uh, ukrainians and uh, me as well more strong and uh, i and you know i i very proud of my country my people my president who are fighting and uh, it it gives me strength because I'm also I'm contacting my family who are facing all these events because I'm like <laughs> in the distance, <laughs> so I'm a little bit isolated from all these moods, uh, but I feel their strengths and yes, people were frightened, but also people are angry. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is some uh, violence as well among Ukrainians because they have to fight, and uh, the simple people also they don't want to runaways they want to fight and uh, yes thank you very much we are full of hope for the peace yes and also please the next uh, uh, Mr. Gen the CTO of the project could you please speak about Edwards the progress thank you Kosana um, hello everybody I'm really honored to be here and then uh, maybe all of the people in the globe are facing the huge problem and then uh, I think the blockchain is the key uh, to uh, realize world, world peace. But maybe most of the people forgot how to use this key. So maybe some people can understand wh what, what we can do with blockchain, but it's just based on from the technology side. We haven't seen, we haven't seen kind of good use case, which is operated by blockchain. So we cannot understand what we can do with this blockchain. Just say like BTC up, BTC down, Ethereum up, Ethereum down. It's stupid. It's just speculation. I think and I hope this blockchain technology can create new world in which, you know, peaceful society is realizable. And as Mr. Tokugawa mentioned, maybe it's like more, you know, Tokugawa era society. People can help to each other. And then 
uh, maybe we can avoid any kind of uh, human nature willing to, you know, start war or something like that. Anyway, ah, hope to, you know, be settled soon. By the way, uh, today I'd like to show uh, two things. Uh, I'm still negotiating with some investors uh, because I know some guy uh, who is super powerful in financial uh, sector. And then I'm still negotiating with some people who can be a strategic partner with our Edubus. And then I'm super surprised to see most of the people uh, really interested in Edo City because this is not like, it's, it's not just like Metaverse. This is the Edoverse. So this Metaverse space has culture and history, which is, you know, supervised by Mr. Tokugawa. This is a fact and real history. In addition to that, for example, I'm Japanese. And of course, I learned a lot about history uh, based on the book, text, something like that from our teacher. But, but today, Mr. Tokugawa mentioned is totally surprising to me because this is kind of the back end of the history. And I think this is a fact of the history. So, of course, I know Oda Nobunaga, I know Toyotobi Hideyoshi, Tokugawa Iesu, blah, blah, blah. I know some, you know, famous guys in history. But on the behind, maybe there's a reason why Oda Nobunaga tries to, you know, unify, unify, the, unify Japan. And then Toyotomi Hideyoshi invaded into South Korea. And then there, there was definitely reason why Mr. Tokugawa Iesu took over the world. And then this is a fact under Edo City. It was, you know, more than 270 years peaceful era. This is a fact, right? So we, we, we can learn a lot of things. So basically when I give some presentation to our parties, I always say like, of course, you know, uh, some Japanese history, but the difference between the typical history and our Edo City is because we have Mr. Tokugawa, and then because Mr. Tokugawa's perspective is super exciting and attractive, especially to this world, because still people are fighting. And then we, we can learn a lot of things from those, you know, historical background so that maybe we can be aware of how we can recreate Edo City with blockchain technology. So in part of blockchain technology, of course, I'm, I know, I know some, you know, something about these possibilities and then future wise, something like that. So if we can combine this historical culture with uh, blockchain tech, and then maybe everything is going to be one world again. Uh, one news I was super surprised today is uh, Russia. Russia decided to use a uh, in, in, Indian card. Indian card is a credit card from China. So the, I think one of the reasons why Russia invaded U Ukraine is because maybe Russia and China will be unified in terms of transaction. So of course, blockchain is one of the huge technology in transactions. So I'm super surprised to see because we are trying to recreate the bus based on blockchain. On the other hand, same people, same human being, you know, fighting and kill, kill other, other people. It's, it's super stupid. Theme is, theme, you know, our theme is same, right? So this transaction should be more peaceful I guess so. Anyway, maybe this uh, we can show some solution to this, you know, huge and super complicated problems, which all of the human being has to solve together. And then this Edo city, I think key concept is going to be peaceful and sustainable society, definitely, because we have Mr. Tokugawa, and then we have you know great partner. So um, anyway, I I really hope uh, that we can show a great Edo city great advice as soon as possible to let the people stop the war, to let the people uh, stop invasion to others. And then it's waste of time for the people to kill others. We have to think and create some new culture, new art in adverse. All we can say is, of course, you can start war only in adverse or only in metaverse. Don't do that in real society, please. Uh, this is my, you know, true yeah, true hope and I pray for the peace. But I'm really looking forward to having, you know, new investors, new partnership, and then we together can recreate it of us, which will help the people be more peaceful and then stop the war as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gen. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. And uh, I think 
maybe yes blockchain will be the tool for creating new world because i feel that world is changing like or not only ukraine and russia but all world is changing and trying to change the perspective uh, so who knows uh, maybe we will fight just in metaverse <laughs> i also praying for this <laughs> so thank you very much also the next uh, is uh, i would like to ask uh, the chief uh, token engineer ts to speak please all right hi oksana uh, let me speak regarding the tokenomics as well as the whole ecosystem <laughs> And um, beforehand, I'm I'm sure that um, the Edwards and Web3 can solve the uh, global issues by the power of the uh, incentives by joining the ecosystem. Therefore, uh, what we should make the most important is to build a sustainable tokenomics. Because um, if the tokenomics is unsustainable, uh, that that that's meaningless. Because uh, unsustainable tokenomics is like uh, like uh, the food of of evil investors. Therefore, uh, my priority is to build a sustainable ec ecosystem by uh, providing liquidities and, of course, providing liquidity providers incentives, as well as the buy buyback uh, functions with the treasury assets and. Um, of course, the uh, interesting con interesting contents for the ecosystem joiners. So, um, what what I'm currently uh, defining is the function of the uh, native token used in Edverse. For example, like the allocation, as well as utilities inside the Edverse, as well as outside of the Edverse. The, the utilities of outside to outside from the Edverse is really important because uh, we should not uh, make make users or investors to provide only for choice of selling. Therefore, uh, I'm thinking of if if the existing participants earn the Edozeni, then they could. They then they could uh, like uh, experience purchasing via Amazon or, or Walmart or other uh, other major global service. That's the uh, uh, and that means Edverse is ESG. So uh, I'm now I'm now uh, negotiating with the potential partners regarding the uh, crypto crypto native uh, products as well as the crypto native and uh, real-world uh, companies for the potential partnerships so that uh, to maximize the uh, benefits of token utility for both Edo Koban and Edo Zeni. So now uh, let me update my progress. So I'm now uh, defining the defining and the fix, uh, going to fixing fix the uh, allocation of Edo Koban and Edo Zeni and how to allocate to the ecosystem incentive. So which action would uh, would uh, get Edo Zeni or Edo Koban like that. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, my update regarding the detailed utilities as well as uh, in, inside the ecosystem as well as outside the ecosystem. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, yes. And uh, also the, the last one, uh, Dominique, could you please uh, speak about the project overall? Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Oksana. We're very concerned in your country and Ukraine now. Uh, Mr. Tokugawa mentioned that actually Japan made a very big mistake in the past before, uh, before Edo period starts. Um, this... Japanese invasion to Korea in the past, actually the history is repeating even in the 21st century. I, I can't believe it actually here. So I um, hope people in Ukraine uh, can survive and also our uh, country should be restored in peace as soon as possible. And then uh, 
Now, uh, what we did the last week, um, I'm happy that uh, we had a very constructive discussion about Edo Zeni and Edo Token designs, as, as T.S. mentioned. Um, we found expect expectation to the Edo Boss was very, very high, as, um, as this game, gaming system seems to be very exciting than the other the gaming things, so, or pray to earn the gaming and the blockchain system. And that was very, uh, and then we had a we had a discussion about soft. We said uh, we got a sim simple agreement for the future tokens, and um, and for us that it, this was the first step. As as the TS mentioned, that you know we had uh, some allocations for a private sale. Of course, there's uh, several percent just for the, the, for the total uh, uh, token issued should be for uh, angel investors, VCs, crypto investors or pure investors. And then after this, we do some of the several percent to a uh, public sale. This is a cryptocurrency exchange or ICO, including uh, incentives to the, to the exchange too. And probably five, no, it's a 10 to 15% to the team members, just including us here. And also the five cents around several percent to the advisors for, uh, for this project. And then rest of those, probably I think that around 70% to 60% of our token should be the token uh, ecosystem incentives using for uh, gaming or maybe uh, staking. Yeah. And probably I think we should set the total maximum amount that the token issued for Edo Zenich. And also we will just um, we will make some discuss on how many Edo Zeni tokens can be converted into the Edo Coban token, yeah, uh, which is more sort of a governance token. Hmm. And then uh, we talked about possibility of IEO probably in uh, in the late this year. Um, after we launched the token in July, just just on schedule, if if we could make it. And we will have to select which exchange that we should use for the IEO very carefully from now. So um, it takes it takes time anyway. And also uh, the, regarding the construction of the VR, um, we will make a general image of the Edo landscape first. And we will show in public as soon as possible, probably um, I think in March or April, so what kind of uh, uh, buildings, what kind of architecture just in the Edubas, um, um we, 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 we want to just make some of the image on this. And then um, we'll fix our uh, idea of the original architectures, like as I mentioned at, at the Edo Castle or Nihon Basi Bridge, or maybe Zojoji Temple at the first step just for the building in the Edubas. And then we're going to just make some construction for the vacant areas to cultivate, to, to reclamate the land. And then that's going to be a really sort of very exciting game just to me, to, to, earn, to earn tokens. So um, we, we just did last week, that's like that, you know, hold a discussion that we made, just to talk in the mix. And then the percentage of the allocations, uh, general, general idea of the percentage of the uh, uh, allocations. Um, we will we will just uh, we will discuss some more in detail uh, this week and next week and to fix up a much uh, more concrete idea about token mix and 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 we are construction. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. I'm very excited about the, all the progress you made and. Uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone who were supporting Ukraine uh, today. And uh, I believe we win. We will win definitely. Yeah, <laughs> so. of course. Um, I, you know, um, it's uh, in crypto, crypto, you know, crypto world. It's many, many donations, over fifty million US dollars worth of uh, cryptocurrency donations.